would love to get an idea a little bit as to what you guys really want to get out of the time today, because I don't know if Tad warned you, I can go off in a hundred different directions. So what do you guys, at the end of the time today, what would you like to go and have said, hmm, this was pretty good, it was worthwhile? I'll, I'll let them speak for the, themselves. If, if, if they go around and say their name, okay. that'd be they can say what, what they think they want to get out of it. That'd be wonderful. Go ahead. Um, okay, I'm Hannah. Hi. Hey, Hannah. Um, I'd just like to just, I guess, get an insight into your experience of uh, the applied or the applied nature of your work and how you work with um, the elite level kayakers. Okay. And kind of what processes you go through, what kind of experiences you've had in the lead up to like really big, important um, competitions and things like that. Okay. Sounds wonderful. I Dolores? Hi, I'm Dolores, and um, I'd like to hear yeah, about your experience as well of uh, competitions. And I would like to know um, do you take the pressure you know, from the athletes? Do you carry it on yourself as well as you know, they're, they're in a highly pressurized environment? And do you feel that as well as part of your job? Interesting question. I, I'm, I'm going to do a quick referral to that. I wrote a chapter in Kate Hayes' new book, Performance Psychology in Action, and the title of the book is The Consultant is a Performer. And it really talks about how you have to go, it goes into detail talking about applying everything that we use, all the skills and techniques we use to help our athletes and our performance with, how I really believe a good sports psychologist applies them to his or her or herself. Okay. Yeah. Good. Michael, I'm, I'm Michael. Okay. And, uh, I was just looking to just try and get a grasp of your own applied experience as well, so I can as well. Okay. Next. I am Carly. I am. Again, same same as the guys. You you've massive experience on the applied side, and it's just I suppose gaining a bit of knowledge as to your experience, and I suppose some of the downfalls you're finding at that elite level, and and I suppose um, some of the pitfalls that you fall or that you've come across, and maybe just sharing some of the some of them stories with us, just so that we could be aware of that side of it as well as the good side. Okay, I I never have any problems. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I, um, um, again, again, I'd just like to get an insight into some of your, of your experiences in the applied field. Okay. Uh, Humzi, um, just the same again. Uh, your own, your own insights and stuff, and then just on the topic itself, it wouldn't be something I would know a massive amount about. So hopefully, we'll go away with a wee bit more knowledge than I came with. Okay. Okay. I'm Kieran, and yeah, just just like the other ones to get your review and things, your perspective okay. on what the podcast happens. Good. So, yeah. Nigel, uh, and again the same, yeah, I'm just maybe hear about a few few experiences you've had, maybe as Caroline said, you know, difficult experiences or things out of the order and stuff, just to hear what goes on. Good. <clears throat> we've, been, what, we've one other guy, Glenn, who's over here, so I'll just get him to come around because he's operating the other. Okay. <laughs> he is essential. Make sure he gets around. Okay, and what would you like to get out of this? Just to hear your good self speaking. That's enough for me. Okay, it's like it's that good southern, it's my Irish accent, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, let me also check. In terms of backgrounds, everybody here is an exercise and science background. Is that right? Uh, Predominantly, yeah. Predominantly. Do, we, do we have anybody that, that's coming from a counseling background, and what's the counseling combination that you have with exercise and sports science? Is there? Not really from a counseling background. No. Okay. Background. Okay. Now that's good. The the reason I ask is that here in the states, we you know we have uh, the the big debate is what does it take really to be a competent applied sports psychologist. And usually there's a, we have two tracks that people come from. Some is the exercise and sports sciences. Others are the coming from the counseling area that will then go and, and 
gain the additional knowledge of exercise and sports science. And I, let me also, and, but to me, that's important to know the context. In fact, as part of the context, I want you to know a little bit about my background, how I approached this, you know, where, how I got to where I am. Uh, and and I, I mentioned the article on contextual intelligence. Have you guys had a chance to see that yet? Yeah, they, they, yeah, they, they have. They, they've seen a little bit of it. Okay, seen a little bit of it. Okay, and you will be they, tested they, on they, this. They're to hand in today for another module, so I, I think they're cramming it right now. Okay, well, don't don't worry about it. But uh, pay attention. I'll walk through you. It's good, but that's also good for me to know the context as to how much you know. How many people here have experiences consulting already? Let me see a show of hands. Okay, we got one person experience with consulting. How many people want to go primarily into consulting after this as opposed to academia? Primarily consulting? How many people see themselves going to academia where you're teaching and going to university? Okay, well, not really certain, but it's a little bit. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good to know with context on that. For my own background, uh, the, there again, context to me is everything. Everything takes its meaning from context. If you look at something out of context, it can look totally nuts. It can look totally ludicrous. If you go and understand the context around a situation and a behavior, my experience is that everything makes sense if you understand the context. My personal context is that I... I'm actually, I think I'm older than what I look, and so I, I, I'm, I'm, I can get away with that. I don't have just the camera, but I'm going to be 62 in a couple of months. And so if I go, see, good, clean living, <laughs> no good, clean living. I'm looking at retirement, buddy. Yeah. Uh, Is that uh, the main point? So what? Is that the mountain bike that's keeping you fresh? It must be. It, it's, it's got to be on that. Um, <laughs> What, and, and the reason I do that is if I start saying, if somebody thinks I'm in my 40s or 50s, and I start saying, well, I did this for 15 or 20 years, and I did this for 15 years, they start doing the math, and they say, you started this when you're six? No. Um, actually, uh, I, you know, I, I, went to, I did my university work, my college work in the 60s. And I, you know, my background originally is working in the mental health side. I have a PhD in counseling psychology, which usually comes from a more strength-oriented focus. And I had a clinical internship that the American Psychological Association approves. And actually, during my first 25 years of practice, I had a traditional private practice here in Charlotte, North Carolina. And if I do say so, I had one of the stronger practices around. Um, I, but my background and my expertise has always had to do with being solution focused, has been very present, has always been building upon strengths, and has also been understanding things in context. And I was known for working with couples, families, and systems at times, actually. I would, if there was a teenager is having difficulty, I was known for working with the teenager, the parents, the teachers, the principal, the, the special assistants. And so it's, you know, I came into the sports psychology area with the background of working with the team around the team. It just happened to be a different style of performance. And it was back during the 90s that I did a re-specialization in sports psychology. And part of this was a very mindful decision on my part where I'm a big proponent of intentional living, that you need to be living your life, spending your time and energies the way that you want. And my wife and I periodically will do retreats with just the two of us, and we'll take inventory of what we're doing. Are we living the lives the way that we want to be doing things? And at that time, I had this great practice, but also a private practice can be, I won't say it's boring. But it's limited. You're, you gotta be, you got to show up. you got to be there. It's hourly wage. And my wife and I are both, you know, at that time, we're avid triathletes. We like to travel. We like to snow ski, mountain bike, road bike. And part of what we were looking at that we wanted to do is saying it would be nice to have a, a, a professional 
you know, identity resource where we could travel. And uh, I was looking at what I was doing. I've been morphing my practice a bit more into the performance work. And at that time, uh, you know, we were saying, well, you know, performance clients, really, if we did that, I could pick up and travel. We can do that remotely. We can do it by video. And so I literally cut back my practice for three years and went, started taking additional courses, did the equivalent of getting a master's in sports psychology, and studied with Dan Gould, who Dan's one of the top sports psychologists I know in North America, and I was, he's pretty well known in national circles too. And Dan was both a very good colleague and mentor where it's, I, thank heavens, I had the wisdom to know what I didn't know. And that's usually the biggest challenge if you look at the pitfalls with consulting. You don't have to know everything, but it's really important to know what you don't know. And my experience is that people coming from that counseling clinical area, they think if I got a PhD in counseling clinical, I know everything there is to go and work with an athlete. And I'm sorry, they don't know about performance excellence. They don't know about the physiology of performance. And they're not prepared, but often they don't know they don't know it. My experience with folks who come from the exercise and sports science is they've got these great tools with performance excellence, but they may not know what they don't know where if a person is dealing with a, truly a clinical issue, it's like you can deal with some, I can deal with some refocusing techniques and mental skills, but if somebody's clinically depressed, I, I, I really need to do something to address that along the way. Um, and so, uh, I felt like Dan was a real good mentor for me where he recognized that I had, you know, I was really well established in one area of, of expertise mm -hmm. and he respected that and I respected his knowledge and spent um, you know, three years getting recertified, re-specialized and, you know, in 96 was when I started the journey and in 2004, I burned the boats, as they say, even though I had this nice steady income from clinical work. In 2004, I said, I'm not going to take any more clinical referrals. I'm just dealing with performance work. And I'll still see deal with clinical issues, but they're all coming from a performer. It's within the performance context, and I think I've got a, a bit of an expertise in that area. And what I've, I've really been fortunate over the past couple of decades, actually, where I've worked with some very, you know, some, some very neat people. I've worked with some folks who, uh, I've been the sports psychologist for the National Whitewater team. I'm also the sports psychologist for one of the swimming centers of excellence. In the U.S., there are three post-collegiate training centers of excellence where if, if you're looking at the number of swimmers who meddled, uh, if you go back to, say, 96, 80% of the medals were, or, or something actually, I, I think 75, 74% of the medals were, were earned by people who were collegiate swimmers. And only something like 24, 26% were by post-collegiate swimmers. If you look at the Beijing Olympics, 80% of the medals were won by post-collegiate swimmers. Swimmers are getting older, more mature, and we had, in the U.S., we had a great feeder system and training system for folks in the college level, but not too much of going on for folks once they graduate from college. And so what they started doing in the U.S. is having three centers of excellence, and actually Charlotte is the model that started the program where uh, we have, um, we've had, we've got one world record holder here. We have had two world record holders or gold medalists. We've got four members of the national team. They've got another uh, center in Baltimore, Maryland, where Michael Phelps swims. You may have heard of him if you follow swimming. And, and we've got one in the West Coast at Fullerton, California. So I get a chance to work with those guys. But also what I've been doing over the past several years is expanding performance consulting to other venues, to other contexts. And I'm the sports psychologist for the North Carolina Dance Theater. And so I work with performing artists. And I've also worked with surgeons um, where uh, we've 
just had a grant. It's, it's like we placed fourth at the Olympics. Our grant qualified out of 100 and 150 some grants, they chose 18 that said, yep, you, may, you meet the criteria. Uh, and it was actually a uh, you know million dollar grant, three year study that builds upon, uh, collaborates with some of the folks in the UK. And I think Adrian Moran is one of the sports psychologists, one of your colleagues, Tag, who's worked with some of the folks there. Um, we made the cutoff, but it turned out they said, but we only have funding for 10. And even though they said, we really do like it, uh, we, we, we weren't in the top 10, we're in the next four. And so they're still trying to scrunch up funds. But it's sort of like fourth place in the Olympics. I mean, nobody, nobody remembers fourth place at the Olympics, I'm sorry. And so I've got that which I'm doing. And uh, it's, in addition to that, I do a lot of business consulting. Um, if you're looking at what I do and what I find, the key is really moving consulting into broader context, moving performance work into broader context. Okay, that's my background. And what I'd like to do now is go to the slideshow presentation since context is everything to me. But let me first of all ask her if there's any questions here. Makes sense? Clear as mud? Or, or else they're, they're very shy Irish people, which I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, Irish people are known for being very shy. Right, particularly around the pups. So, you know. Okay, I I do welcome conversations uh, and, and and questions, and I apologize it, for my accent. If if we need a translator, we'll try and do that. And sometimes I love the Irish brogue, but I have to have a translator with it. So you're going to have to speak very slowly for me at times. Um, well, let's try this this notion and start that slideshow if we can on contextual intelligence where if there's one thing that for me has been essential for my success it's really developing contextual intelligence situations and it, it, it has shaped everything that I do where, to me, it, everything takes meaning and context. And if you can go to the objectives, how's our slideshow working there? Cause, okay, okay. go to the objectives. I want to give an overview of contextual intelligence. And I may or may, just due to the time we have, we may not have a chance to do a contextual intelligence of a case example. But I provided tag with materials where you can go and you can walk through that on your own and hopefully it makes sense. And I want to talk particularly about a model that I've used actually for oh, 30 years, 35 years for mapping out and trying to understand context and making contextual intelligence, contextually intelligent decisions. And I want to talk about ways you can apply this to your own consulting, then have a chance to answer questions. So let's go to the next slide for the keys to successful consulting. And the first time I heard the phrase contextual intelligence was actually around 2000. To 2003, when I was interviewing Dan Gould for the book that Kate Hayes and I co authored, Your Own Consulting for Peak Performance. And I was asking Dan about what really made his work successful, what made him unique, because Dan is just really shown in the world of sports psychology consulting. And Dan was saying something like, Well, you know, I'm not always the brightest guy. And I was thinking, Yeah, Dan, you're not. No. <laughs> If you have to know Dan, he's really incredibly bright, but he's got a wicked sense of humor. But he's saying, I'm not always the brightest guy, but i got a good way of figuring out what's going on around the person. I've got a good idea of what fits. And he was saying it's sort of like Goldman's emotional intelligence, but it's not just dealing with emotions. It's dealing with the big picture and how things work. And I said, like contextual intelligence and he said yeah like contextual intelligence and to me I was really tickled I thought I invented it right then that I had a franchise on this phrase and term but it really did grasp that idea as to what works where you understand the bigger picture 
And from that, I started studying the phrase contextual intelligence. And I actually found, and uh, by the way, on this slide, what kind of information is critical about the field for a consultant to know, for lack of a better word, context, 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 and context. That was the quote from Dan Gould. And when I started looking at contextual intelligence, I discovered that actually the psychologist Robert Sternberg had, was probably the first to coin the term in 85 when he had what he called his triarchic model of intelligence. where he, there, According to Sternberg's model, you've got analytical intelligence, which is what we tend to think of when we think of traditional intelligence like performance and verbal intelligence. But he also talked about analytical, excuse me, creative intelligence, which had to do with the idea of taking seemingly unrelated pieces of information and put them together in new ways. And that was different from traditional analytical intelligence. But then he talked about contextual intelligence. He said it was practical knowledge and the practical application of knowledge in real world situations. It tends to be an external interactive process. It is not normally taught in schools and classrooms. It's usually, in fact, it was learned informally through mentoring and on-the-job training, so to speak. And it's, it really looked at how to adapt to an environment to be successful. And also, you know when to hold them, you know when to fold them. It's, it's, it's the kind of information you need to know when you say, you know, change is not going to work in this situation. And he found that contextual intelligence was actually the best predictor of real-world success. You can be the brightest guy in the world. And we interviewed for our book, for you on, we interviewed, you know, some top, performers in business, performing arts, and high-risk occupations. And I remember and we asked them about their experience with consultants. And this one guy in business said, this guy was really, really bright and he really knew stuff, but he just would not fit. I mean, it was a shame. He had a lot of knowledge, but he just would not fit. Now, and, and that, to me, is a great example of somebody who's really smart, but they don't have contextual intelligence. Now, if you go to the next slide, that's a, there's an educational researcher by the name of Taryn Zini who had studied successful consulting in educational settings in school, university, and college settings. And he had this model that I really do like. He said at the first, you got this tier one level of skills that you need to have. And that's basic skills and techniques. And that's the kind of stuff you learn in a classroom. Anybody can learn that. But you learn it through books. It's educational. That's your nuts and bolts. In fact, Kate Hayes and I in our book, we even went a step further and we looked at effective consulting. And from what we found with the feedback from the folks we've worked with, there's really five basic skill groups that you need to have. You need to have, first of all, you've got to have some model of performance excellence. You've got to have an idea of what really constitutes you know, performance excellence and peak performance. You've got to have some knowledge of the physiological basis of performance. But that's not enough. Those are just tools that you bring out. You also have to have relationship skills where you can form a relationship very rapidly. And you have to have change skills where you know how do you help people change. And then the fifth thing is that you really need to have some framework for operating in a larger system, some, you know, some way of understanding how a system works if you're going to be effective. And those are foundational skills that you can learn in, you know, studying, formal study, classroom, and you need to start with that. But that's not going to be enough because then you have to be effective. You've got to move up to the Tier 2 level. And that looks at the particular area in which you are going to be consulting. And you need to know about the common issues. Like if you're doing whitewater paddling, 
you got to know about what are the issues they have to deal with. Well, they got to deal with mental rehearsal. They got to be able to deal with uh, you know, how do you deal with navigating a course where you cannot practice on it. You have to mentally rehearse it. You have to deal with activation management. That's going to be a common issue. And to me, one of the most critical issues that is still going to be the hot topic over the next decade is recovery. The top athletes, top performers, in my experience, they know how to work their fannies off. But the key is to figure out how to balance the, the, the training, the stress states, with smart recovery so that you don't get in a recovery imbalance. If we're dealing with common issues, we're looking at with the white water again, you got to deal with travel issues. How do you deal? I mean, what's one of the big issues we're dealing with? We've got the team here. Our white water guys are just rabid individuals. I mean, you know, the U.S., we're, you know, we start with a revolution from the UK, you know, and some of that mentality still goes. And, you know, the Americans, we can be cocky, we can be arrogant, we can be all that self centered. And we're going to put these guys together, you know, in 18 of them in five cars in small hotel rooms and have them travel around Europe for five weeks, maybe even six weeks this summer. How to deal with stress, team dynamics, and situations, those are going to be common issues. If you deal with dancers, you're going to have to deal with eating disorders. You're going to have to deal with image issues. If you deal with gymnasts, there again, you're going to have to deal with weight issues, eating disorders. What are the common issues you have to deal with? And you, you can get information about those common issues by studying up on the sports, by reading the magazines, by volunteering, by spending time, by doing it, your, doing it yourself. But, and, and you'll be somewhat successful if you know that, but if you really want to be effective, the key is that third tier. And, and that's where Terenzini used the, the term contextual intelligence also. And that's knowing how do these issues play out in this particular setting, how do these, how do, how can you apply those tools that you have from tier one to address those issues that have to do with the field in this particular setting, in this particular team? And that's where, that really is the key, in my opinion. If, if, if you want to be really effective, if you know if you got a good foundation of the tools, that's your toolbox. And if you got a good foundation of the issues, that's going to be your, your language in the issues you got to deal with. But you really want to become efficient at looking at how do you apply those in this particular context. And if you look at how this has been playing out in the past decade, this really sort of sets the, the stage for how, in my opinion, and we're seeing this in some of the writings in the, in the U.S., we're not really talking about sports psychology anymore. We're talking about performance psychology. And sports happens to be the context in which the performance occurs. And if you look at the basic skills and techniques as being... Yeah, that's where sports psychology is, a, is really key. But what are the common issues? You start looking at the context. The, the research that Kate and I did with our book, we're saying, you know, these principles apply in the performing arts. They apply in business. They apply in high-risk occupations like medicine. And so it really is performance psychology with sport being a particular arena of expertise. Does that make sense to you guys? Had I hit anybody's button, they said, nah, we can't take that. Yeah, it does. I, I'll just give you an idea about two weeks ago, we had uh, one of Aidan Moran's students, uh, who was a pro golfer for four years, he said if people want to learn about golf, they should become a caddy for a while. Yeah. So that, that's a tier two thing. But that's a tier two, absolutely. I think on the tier three thing, I think it's... In Ireland, we don't have that many professional consultants that work across different domains. Although, for example, Aidan would have worked with one of the dance troops, Riverdance, uh, and 
you know, there's some people that work across different contexts. Right. Typically, we're, we, we've had people who've been kind of anchored in the sport context with only one or two, I suppose, outliers who've worked across a range of things. Yep. Well, see, and, and that's actually, when I first came to the field of sports psychology, that is, I felt like there was this big void that was calling me there because uh, contextual intelligence and understanding context, that's what my first 20, 25 years was all about in the systems theory. And so if you go, let's go to the next slide and look at it. And I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a, a background. First of all, if you look at contextual intelligence and performance psychology, back in the, around the turn of the century, you started having people addressing the issues, but they didn't really have a way of sort of structuring the conversations. In the consultant interviews that Kate and I did, everybody mentioned how important it was to understand the system. You had to have street smart. You had to understand the system. You had to understand the way the system worked. There's been some articles and a lot of, uh, of, of programs by Ken Revisa talking about gaining entry. When we're talking about gaining entry to a system, we're talking about contextual intelligence. And back around 2000, after the Australian Olympics, there are a, were a number of articles published in uh, some American journals I'm more familiar with in the Sports Psychologist and the Journal of, of Exercise and Sports Psychology. Um, uh, the non team factors that impact performance at the Olympics, looking at the, 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 the actions by government bodies, by parents, by families. And so the issue is there, but the truth of the matter is that has not been the expertise of sports psychologists. And so the question, let's go to the next slide, is how does one really understand about context? It's sort of like you're immersed in the context, but how do you understand about it? And if you go to the next slide, systems theory is really all about context. It is the study of context. It provides a structure for understanding, for having conversations. It provides a structure and a language for talking about contextual you know, intelligence and making contextual intelligent interventions, and it offers intervention guidelines. And if there is a fundamental message that I encourage every consultant to do is be more of an anthropologist than a missionary. And systems theory actually evolved from the works of anthropology. Gregory Bateson was one of the, he was an anthropologist who actually studied interactions. He's, a lot of people don't realize he was married to Margaret Mead, who was a famous anthropologist also. But systems theory is really is the study as to how, how things work. And when I see young professionals, young consultants, go in, when they goof up, they go in like a missionary. A missionary runs in, I've got the answer, I've got the answer. Let me tell you what to do, how to make your life wonderful. And... I'm sorry, the tribe has been getting along pretty well for uh, several hundred years without you, and why are they going to all of a sudden change everything they're doing because you got this new idea? And what an anthropologist does instead, the anthropologist goes in and seeks to seek first to understand. Understand what's going on. And once you understand then you can begin making suggestions for change. And quite honestly, one of the, the guidelines for having been trained in systems theory is that for any intervention to be effective, two criteria have to be met. One, let's go to the next slide. It has to be in that person's language. You've got to use their language. And the second thing, it has got to fit their view of reality. If you don't put it in their language, 
if it doesn't fit their experience and their reality, I'm sorry, it's not going to be effective. They're not going to buy it. And you can, it's sort of like, you can be the brightest person in the world. You can have all these great skills, but the language is so incredibly important. If you go to France, if you don't speak French, I'm sorry. You're going to be minimally effective. If you go to France, and if you don't understand some of the customs, you're going to be minimally effective. Everybody from the U.S. always talks about how rude the French are. And i got to say, I, I, I've always had delightful experiences when I'm in France. I've had French people come to my assistance many times. They've been perfectly delightful. But I, I, I've got to say, I think it's because I go in as an anthropologist and you learn some of the customs, you learn how to approach someone politely, and it makes all the difference in the world. Uh, all you ever know is about the French was kind of had lost the world, like Tony Estonga, he was playing C1 for about 10 years, and then his brother, it's unfair, you know, his brother was winning from the previous games, so it's, that's all I know, is I, I wasn't picking him one. Yeah. But there's, my experience is traveling abroad, it's sort of like back, I went to Russia back right after Perestroika. And one thing you had to learn in Russia was that people would not tell you no directly at those times. If you wanted something, they would not say no because they'd come from a culture where if you told somebody no, you're liable to wind up in a gulag. With, in, I'll tell you the key for actually getting assistance in France. First thing you have to always say is good day. You have to show you have manners. He always said, bonjour, monsieur. And there is a seven-word phrase that, if you say this, it's magic. Excusez-moi de vous déranger, mais j'ai un problème. It is, excuse me for bothering you, but I have a problem. If you do that, I've had, ah, people, you know, they'll give you the shirt off their back. And so when you're fit, trying to fit a person's language, let's go to the next slide. You need to know their technical language. And if you're dealing with a, a domain in a sport, you need to know the technical language, like a 360. And, and I'm gonna, if I adjust this, am I still in the picture? Yeah, you're good. Am I centered in the picture? Yeah. Okay, good. I had to get a little bit. And how many people know what a 360 is? What's a 360? <laughs> it's a spin, okay. If you're a 360 in kayak, what does that mean? You're going to do a spin. If you're a 360, if you're doing a 360 in, uh, oh, I don't know, in dance or gymnastics, you're talking about 360. Does anybody know what a 360 is in business? Yeah. Okay. Business is 360. If you're going to be in business, you need to know 360 is where you're going to get information from above, peers, and below. 360 degrees evaluation of the individual. How many people know what a six pack is? Yeah, they, they, they don't want to show you. They don't want to show me. <laughs> well, are, are we talking about with beer or volleyball? I, I think we're not talking about them here. Okay. And six packs in the UK, you know, at six packs in the US, we're always talking about beer. In volleyball, does anybody know what a six-pack is? In vo you need to know if you're working with volleyball, particularly beach volleyball. A six-pack is when somebody spikes the ball into the other person's face, and the other person mix misses the block, and it got its name from the fact that anybody that could spike the ball into the opponent's face, they would get a six-pack of beer afterwards. It's common, at least all over the U.S. You need to know the technical language like that. Was there a question in the back? No, they're gone shy again. Okay. And, and the technical language is really important if somebody comes from a clinical background. You really want to be talking about wellness and excellence instead of illness or problems. You really want to be solution focused. For example, you know, and, and I am always normalizing using healthy language with my athletes. If somebody says they have, you know, where most people who come from a psychology background, somebody will talk about getting nervous before an event, and a, a, a clinically trained person without contextual intelligence will say, oh, you have anxiety. Great. No. 
you know, if you've got good contextual intelligence, you got butterflies. You know, small difference, but it makes a big difference with how people will be receptive to what you're saying. You can say, if you go in, okay, tell me what your problems are versus tell me what you're concerned about. There again, the small differences make all the differences. And you need to know the unique language of the system. I live in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we have American football and we've got the Carolina Panthers. Okay, they talk about Panther pride here. Now, if I were to go to one of the, the real football teams in the U.K., where they play real football, and if I started using the term Panther Pride, I mean, like, what? That, I mean, that says nothing. So you've got to fit the language of the system, not only the broad language, but also the language of the team in the context. Are you guys still with me? All good. We're rolling. And so then the question goes, let's go to the next side. How do you fit your intervention to a person's reality? And the key is you want to make a map. And if you, you, you want to develop a contextual map. And let's go to the next slide of developing contextual maps. And those are three maps that are all equal and valid. You know, one's actually a weather map of the U.S. The other is a topo map. The other is a road map around where I live. Now, all those, those are actually quite valid maps. But if you're wanting to know how to get from Charlotte to up in the mountains, that weather map's not going to do you any good at all. And the topo map, you know, that's going to be really helpful if you're doing a small hike, but that road map's not going to do you much good, or the weather map. And the truth of the matter is that at any point in time, there's an infinite amount of information that you have around you that you've got to organize into some pattern, some system that makes sense. That is our way that we make decisions. You are organizing information all the time, whether or not you're aware of it, you're developing these mental maps. And the key for successful consulting, in my experience, is understanding how to select information that is going to help you make contextually wise decisions. The value of any map is how well does it make you how well does it help you make decisions? And how well does it help you understand your successes in the times you were not successful? To me, that's really the key for a map. Everybody still with me on that one? Okay, let's go to the next slide then. Now, as I was saying, you know, you could be organizing anything into these con to, to make your contextual map. But I've got four things that I found particularly helpful to focus upon. The first one is structure. The second one are the patterns that go on within the system in the organization. A, your th third one is the attitudes. And the fourth one is the means of influence in the situation. And I'm going to go into these in de each one in detail. But you put those together and they spell spam. Now, do you guys in Ireland know what spam is? If a few of us have been to America, probably. Okay, it's. Been to the States, I think they know. It's a luncheon meat. It's a luncheon meat by Hormel. And I'm not saying it's like haggis, but it's like. It's a little bit of this, it's a little bit of that, it's all chopped up, and it's not really fancy, but it gets the job done. But So, spam it is, but the other thing that's sort of neat about it is actually spam is map spelled backwards. So, you know, I, I lovingly refer to this as the spam model. Let's go to the next slide. And when we're talking about the first element, structure, we're really talking about Who's in charge? And every organization has a formal structure and an informal structure. 
you can know what the you know the formal the formal hierarchy is all about, but if you've had any experience in the real world, there's an informal hierarchy that can make the make the decision. The guy who used to be president of the Bank of America uh, had an administrative assistant who worked his front desk, and she'd been with him for 40 years. And even though she was not high up on the formal structure, if you looked at who was able to make appointments and and really have success dealing with the, the, the CEO, if that assistant didn't like you, forget it. Forget it. And so you got the formal structure and the informal structure. And if you once you get that information, you can use that to make a decision as to follow one of the principles in systems therapy is you always want to join through the hierarchy. You want to join from the top down. If you're just working with the athlete, but the coach really doesn't think you're worth squat, I'm sorry, you're going to be minimally effective. And even if the coach likes you, but the owner of the team doesn't like you, if the owner thinks that sports psychology is a bunch of bluey, you're not going to be effective. You want to join from the top down, and you're always going to have more long-term success. Okay. Makes sense again. Okay, got, let's go to the next one. Let's talk about the patterns. And patterns have to do with understanding how information flows within the, in the system. And it's almost like who does what at what time within the system. There is always a, a, a pattern. Uh, and understanding how the system works, it's really like working with whitewater paddlers. I really do love it because the key there is that you really want, don't fight the river, use it. You know, always use it. I know some people get really ticked off. I, I use an example from graduate school. Uh, when I was working on my dissertation, I knew a number of people who would go and they do their research for three, four years to take it to the committee. And when you take it to the committee, you really have this piece of information. You're probably one of the leading experts in the world on it. And you bring it to the committee. And if you understand the roles, the committee is there to crit criticize it and find something wrong. I mean, that's their job. If they don't find something wrong, they haven't done their job very well. And I can't tell you how many of my buds, when it was time to go to defend their, their dissertation, they would go in, the committee would say, you have to change this, and they would just be so irate that they couldn't look at it for three weeks. And they would go and just uh, I put it aside and just take them forever because they're so ticked off about it. When it came time for me to do my dissertation and take defend mine, well, actually, I shouldn't say this. I had a friend who, do, who did this. It wasn't me, really. Um, but this person I knew understood that the committee had to find something wrong. And so I literally picked three things. And I said, I bet they're going to want to change this. They're going to change this. And I predicted three of them. And I said, they could be mistakes. I got a rash, or my friend said, I got a rationale for that. I got a rationale for that. But these are probably going to be three changes instead of taking something imperfect. I went in and there, and, and sure enough, they found two of them, and, and they said, you need to change that. And they overlooked the third one, so I brought it up to them. I said, what about this one? And they said, ah, oh, yeah, no, that's okay. Why don't you go with that? And they threw in two more changes that I hadn't counted on. But it was like, I understand what they needed to do in their job, and it, it didn't upset me. I was able to do my revisions. I was out of there in one week. Now, some people say, was that manipulative? Eh, I don't think it's manipulative. I understood the system. I understand how it works. It's sort of like if you go in, and if you ever expect a coach to back down in front of his players, you don't understand the system. If you want the coach to do something different, you pull the coach off to the side, and the coach is liable to do a lot, but the coach has got to be able to save face. 
Is that manipulative? It understands the way the system works. You're being an anthropologist. And I actually think whitewater paddling is one of the great ways to, great examples of that, because a lot of people, if they have any experience in paddling, they'll think, well, the shortest distance is from here to there. But if it's an eddy or if the current's fighting against you, it can take you forever. And the person who understands how the river flows, they'll take two strokes upstream and boom, they're across there just before you, know, you could ever hope, I mean, before you can blink an eye. So understand how information works, understand how people make decisions, who does what at what times, and don't fight the river, use it. Are you guys, is, yeah? Is the key, like, even when we're looking at the timing of our interventions and kind of periodization? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a time and a place. And that part of that is understanding is, is how does information flow. And part of the timing actually, if you let's go to the next slide and look at attitudes. And part of what you want to do is you want to, what do people value here? What are things they really value? Uh, and you want to make your choices and your rationale for actions consistent with what they value. Is this a, a, a place where they value mental toughness? Well, then you want to go ahead and emphasize this, what, this is a way to help you be mentally tough. If, you know, to me, the greatest example of this is I've worked with football players and dancers simultaneously. So both of them, I wanted to learn relaxation techniques. Well, if I go in and tell the, you know, the, the rationale for the football player, if you get really relaxed, you're going to be able to dial into your ideal performance state, and it's going to help your reaction time. You want to be able to manage your adrenaline better. Okay. Now, if I went and said that to a dancer, what would they care about? The dancer would say, if you do this, if you get relaxed, you're going to be better able to connect with your ideal performance state and the emotions that you want to express in this piece here. Now, can you imagine going to a football player or a rugby player and say, this is going to help you better express the emotions you want to do during this point in time? I mean, it's not going to work. You've got to make it fit. You know, what's, what's the attitudes and the values? And that also has to do with attitudes and values. The, the timing of your intervention will also come into place there because you've got to help them save face. And they, if they value saving face, and particularly if sports psychology is a little bit marginally accepted, um, they're going to have trouble with that. You may have to do that on the sly. You do it back one-on-one -on -one before you can get where you do interventions right there in front of folks. Um, and let's go to the, the next slide. Look at the means of influence. And the means of influence are looking at what are the options available for a person to influence others in the system. And I know a lot of people will use the phrase control. They talk about who has control. And my granddaddy used to always say control is an illusion. You only have control to the extent that a person is willing to participate with you in that relationship. If you think about means of influence, you have a lot more options. And if you think about, for example, uh, uh, most coaches, they have means of influence to give you attention. They can give you playing time. Sometimes they can give you praise. Sometimes they can give you punishment. You can have an owner who can give uh, bonuses, give rewards like that, financial, give times off. And players may have limited you know, means of influence, but you still have Everybody has some means of influence in the system. Sometimes a player, they can work hard, they can do extra work. Sometimes they can go and tell the, the actually sort of cultivating a relationship with the coach. You can do extra work outside. But you always want to assess, to understand the system is looking at what are the means of influence that each person, each player has. And one of the rules of, from performance consulting is you want to broaden and build upon the existing means of influence. For example, if you have a coach who is always one of those hard guys who's always negative, 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 part of what you can do is say, well, you know, you do that, but you may be more effective. You can broaden that. You don't stop it, but broaden it. 
if you have a, a coach who's always positive, 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 and they're not getting the results, you may actually want them to broaden it where they come down a little bit harder at times. With me again so far. Uh, let's go to this next slide. And one of the keys for consulting, particularly with young consulting starting off, is that it's real easy to be closely aligned with your athlete. Usually you're close to their age. You've had similar experiences. It's real easy to identify with them. But if you really want to be effective as a system, you got to back off and see the big picture. It's sort of like, I don't know if you can tell what that's a photograph of, but that's actually, if you're down at ground level, it's a maze. If you get up in the air, that's a picture of an apple tree with an apple orchard in a basket down there. But you got to back away to see the big picture. And if you look at the broad perspective, you really want to recognize that everybody has different realities. The player has one reality. They're trying to make the team. They're trying to get the, either scholarship, money, whatever on that. The coach is in a situation where they got to deal with players, they got to deal with players' families, they got to deal with recruiting. That's their reality. They got to juggle all those balls. And and I don't know what the equivalent is in Ireland, but we have athletic directors at universities where they've got to deal with funding from alumni, they've got to deal with publicity, university, all these different things. And the reality is that they've got to live in those realities. And they've got to take those aspects into consideration. And my experience is that People really do try and do their best. I've never known anybody in a performance situation out there saying, oh, let's see if we can really mess things up right now. They don't do that. They're doing the best they know how. And in my experience, you're doing a disservice if you join totally with an athlete and start saying, well, the coach doesn't understand, doesn't get it. They're just mean. They're just trying to screw you up. I, I, I don't by that, just like I don't believe that athletes and performers try to sabotage themselves. I, I think they're doing the best they know how. They may have some things they're having trouble handling. And one of the, the it's a small difference that can make a big change in how effective you are, is if you start encountering somebody and you start thinking about them being resistant Think about them being protective. And that's really a difference between a missionary and an anthropologist. And if, if you think about that, when somebody's resistant, what do you do to resistance? Resistance means you got to plow through it. you got to really hit through it. If somebody's being resistant, you gotta, you got to fight that resistance. But let's say that somebody's being protective. What do you do if somebody's being protective? What do you do if somebody's being protective? How do you deal with the person who's being real protective? That's a, that's a real question. Speak up. See, you may be being protective right now where you don't want to say something that would sound silly. You're not, are you, I'd say, I don't think you're being resistant. I th is that either intentionally being resistant? Or are you being a little protective right now? So how do you deal with somebody who's, who's being protective? Get them to break down barriers just to try and understand why they're being protective. You try and understand why they're being protective to lower it. You try and show them that it's safe. As opposed to if they're being resistant, you plow through the walls. If somebody's being protective, you get them to lower their barriers, which means you need to understand it. You want to show them that it's safe. In fact, my experience as an anthropologist is that if somebody is really being protective, and if you can't show them that it's safe, I'm not certain that you ought to go in and, and encourage them to do something differently unless it can be safe because you don't you don't have to live in their shoes. Like to go and say, you need to go and tell the coach this and you need to stand up for your rights. 
hey, you know, that may not be safe. And you're going to leave afterwards. You need to understand. And you will always, if there's, if there's a takeaway from this, think, resi think protective instead of resistant. Think anthropologist. And as an exercise, and we're, we're running short of time uh, a little bit. I, I'm aware of this. We're going a little bit over, and actually, I got another call at 1:30. So, I, Tad, I, I would really encourage you guys, if you're if you have half a mind to is to have this discussion as to going back over a situation in which you've encountered resistance and how might you describe that person's behavior as being protective. Well, actually, let's do that for just a moment right now. Ha has anybody here encountered a consulting situation where they thought the person, they encountered somebody who they thought was being resistant? Nobody's encountered that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. It's, then tell me, what can you think about that and sort of reframe it, how the person may have been protected? Well, I guess they, they were in, in transition or they're pretty insecure about any change. So you just have to give them the space and time to, to change. I don't know, basically, you, you, you have to uh, enable them to, to just feel like, they're in control and they can change whenever they want. Absolutely. And sometimes, sometimes it's worth waiting because you know, otherwise it's not a process. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things, excellent example, Dad. Excellent example. And uh, to me, that's something I encourage practical when people are dealing with practical and applied situations to always, if you ever feel like you're hitting a barrier, think protective instead of resistance. I often have heard you know, at, at young consultants say, well, the coach is real resistant to sports psychology services. Well, think about the coach from the coach's perspective. They're being protective. You're an unknown quantity. And they may have, you may think that you want to go in with your, you know, have access to their lead player. That's like their crown jewels that they're going to go and let this unknown person come in. Coach doesn't know how you're going to work with the team. Coach doesn't know what you're going to be telling that person. If you can get it where you can demonstrate to the coach that you'll be working with the coach as part of the team and as their philosophy and where the coach can see that you are a reliable individual, then they're going to figure, oh, it's safe to trust you. And to begin with, you're going to be safe to deal with certain situations, but not other situations. You'll always be more effective that way. Let's move on to the next slide because that sort of brings to a, a, a wrap up the formal presentation. I want to allow five or ten minutes for question and answers. I've tried to give you an overview of contextual intelligence, and even though we haven't done the formal case example, to give you some ideas as to how it fits in case settings. And I really do encourage you to go back to look for practical applications here. Um, so let's open this up for questions right now. And you guys can get questions, and I'll try and give the answers. How's that? Yeah, I'm going to pose one on behalf. I don't want to name them. Okay. But they did. We do, we do sham consulting, and we also do some applied work with college teams. And okay. In one setting, they were due to meet at an individual coach, we turned up with, I think, three or four of, the, of his staff. So we had two sides, so it was a four to two ratio. And they encountered a lot of resistance from, from the pool of coaches then. But, I mean, I think the context is interesting because we knew we were only going to try influence a little bit and, uh, and provide some support for the coach because it was close to competition time. Right. And it, I think it, it's... It's an interesting question. Is if you have a group in that scenario, how, how do you how do you cope? It's not just with one individual. It's yep. Resistance, but it can be yep. group. What and let me make sure I understand that you were doing. A, was this an actual coach showed up with the team? The coach showed up with the other coaches. We were offering him some uh, some psych support prior to the challenge. Okay, and are you saying that it seemed like the coach was resistant? 
Yeah, well, he turned up with other, like, four, I think, two or four other coaches. I don't want to single out the scenario, um, but just in terms of maybe the dynamic change because of, you know, uh, maybe he wasn't that resistant, but the other coaches were. So, so the message was yep. kind of maybe diluted in the media. Absolutely. And, so, and if you take that example, and this is where my background as a systems therapist uh, people used to consider me to be a little bit nuts because I always welcomed as many people in as possible. I, I did a family therapy session one time with 19 people in it. I had you know extended families, I had teachers, everybody, and I'd say the more, and, and my philosophy is that I like all the help I can get, and if you look at them as being help. Now, when you have that situation, how might you see the coaches that seem resistant? If you think about them, if can you, how what how how might they have been being protective? What were they being protective of, and what do you think was going on there that may be an, a, a, an issue that they were protecting? Well, certainly, I, I was in the yep. uh, I think I'm interested myself what was happening there. They didn't know myself, and it was going to be. They didn't know, they hadn't met us before, whereas the manager, he knew our background, but he mightn't have made the other guys aware of us, so therefore they might have thought maybe they're giving away information that might go outside the camp. But yep. they the trust wasn't there. Yep. So that's why it was, I think it was, uh, they were being more protective rather than. than yep. Brand new relationship, that, and the coach may say, You come in here, the sports out of college, good, you got to be. Bring them in and said, "Here, I was like, no relationship, doesn't have any idea of what you're all about, and you're not really sure of the way the coaches explain this." And so, to me, that's one of those great examples. As an anthropologist, I like to go ahead and figure out a little bit. Okay, what do you guys know about this situation? How did we get together? What's your understanding as to what we're here, what we're doing here, and. I always like to go back like I did with you. So what do you want to get out of this? The coach has brought you in, and obviously the coach has, sees being some value here, But and I always acknowledge that, but you don't know me from Adam, and you may have some reservations. It's so, uh, what would, you know, what is it, what would you like to get out of here? What are some of the concerns? And it goes back to a phrase that Stephen Covey used once, seek first to understand. Always seek first to understand. And you're right. Group situations are, to me, they're a lot more tricky. And it takes, uh, you can have a lot more impact that way. But it, it you, for, particularly if somebody is new and doesn't have a lot of experience, it can be a bit overwhelming. And that's where I say, if you're the anthropologist, you don't have to know all the answers. I consult with sports I don't know anything about, you know, I'm a quick study, but like, I got a bad back. I don't paddle. I can't do a canoe, but, you know, but I'm real. The key to me is always you got to be real respectful of what the other people are doing, of their expertise. And I never go in saying, oh, I can help you do this, you know, and you never go in down, you know, cutting down somebody else. You go in trying to figure out. What have you been doing? What's working? How do we build upon that? What are the places you have difficulty? And you listen for the pain. And you don't go in trying to sell them your bill of goods. You try and find out what they're concerned with. And then you've got your toolbox. How can you use your tools to work in their context with the problems, the, the concerns they have identified? using their language, and you want to help them solve problems. Does that make sense? Other qu got time for one more question, probably, unless it's my age or my favorite color. Green. Just, see, just on the, the three-tier model, would you, would you be of the opinion that that's what would make a successful psychologist? Or do you think there's anything else to be added to it? Okay, I've got to have a translator there. The brogue, I love it, but I, I'm not following it between. <laughs> <laughs> the, the three-tier model, 
Yes. Would you be of the opinion that that is what makes a successful psychologist? It, actually, yes. And regardless of the context, I think that makes a successful psychologist in any setting. And I think that's any applied... If you're trying to be a change agent, if you're trying to help people change, I think that three-tier model, the Terenzini model, is just spot on. Good question. I have one question. Yep. You, you know when you mentioned mental toughness? Yep. That topic here. Um, you're talking about it in terms of PSD and resilience and that kind of way rather than kind of what the, I think some researchers in the UK have a, a test called the MTQ48. So yeah. Are you going the side kind of cellular model of it or the mental toughness just by itself? Mental toughness by itself, actually. That, and I would use that, uh, it depends. Mental toughness may mean something different in a different team situation. Uh, I will use the language that for the team, so I'm not referring to it with the formal. And that's a delightful, uh, you've just pointed out an important part of context of which I was unaware that that's part of your context of which you are particularly aware and that language that I use has special meaning to you that really doesn't have the same meaning for me. So that's a great point of clarification. Great. I, am, I, can, be, I can be more contextually intelligent now in having my conversations with folks from the UK and from Ireland. Great. Okay, you have to go, do you? I do have to go, and this has been an honor and a privilege. What I'm going to be doing, I've recorded the session today, and I will go look over it, maybe do a little cleanup, put a little spiel to it, and then give a tad a copy where you guys can go back and look at it later on. Um, I also will do a, a shameless plug for my website, drcharliebrown.com. And uh, you may want to be, I'm in the midst of doing a... Um, work over and I've got a lot of good stuff that I tend to give away for free and at some point in time I actually I'm going to more web based since I'm not able to work as much with amateur athletes I'm actually doing some training opportunities online that way so thank you guys for the opportunity it's a privilege and an honor and I wish you all the very very best in all your endeavors Great. thank you take care Bye.